Well, quite a few European countries are going into a third wave. Now, this is the first wave way back in, what, January, February, March, April 20. Now, th this is not as small as it looks because the testing here was perhaps a factor of 50 less than it is later on. So this was actually probably a very comparable numbers, overall numbers to these higher peaks here but limited testing, so that's the official data. Second wave, but the point is we're going into a third wave now, almost certainly, driven by the new variants. As we know, this was the UK's third wave, driven by the new variant. That's what the new variants can do. And in the United States, cases are flattening off, although the new variants are becoming more prevalent but the vaccination program in the states is going remarkably well whereas the vaccination program of course in the european countries is not that is the that is the the main difference that's going to be a big difference over the next few months looking good for the states and looking not so good unfortunately for european countries welcome to this talk it's friday the 19th of march bit of international news today some quite important trends going on both in europe and in the rest of the world countries that kind of got away with it so far almost are really suffering quite badly now so we'll look at a couple of examples of those and indeed what we can do about it the United States, first of all, last seven days. Now, this is the average number of cases over uh, per day over the last seven days. So what they do here is they take the, uh, the total number of cases over seven days, divide it by seven, and it gives us this rolling average. It's a better indication. It gets rid of the, the sort of daily fluctuations that, that confuse the issue. So an average of 53,463 new cases per day officially diagnosed that's the official number now getting on for 30 million officially diagnosed cases. And likewise, deaths, I'm afraid there's been 1,049 deaths per day on average over the past seven days, bringing the death total up to 536,734. Um, large numbers, and it's carrying on in the States. It's, it's carrying on, even though the, number, the overall numbers are going down. So as we see here, we have uh, the number of cases going down, levelling off. But still at a fairly high level. I mean, that, that line there is the 50,000 line. So more than 50,000 new cases per day, as we've just seen. And deaths, again, not going down anything like as quick as we would want in the States. Still over 1,000 deaths per day on, uh, on average. Uh, 1,111 uh, from that date there. It varies, of course, slightly from day to day, even though it's a rolling average. So um, it's still, it's still, it's still not going away. It's there's still a lot of people suffering and dying, unfortunately. Check these out for yourself. Daily trends. Um, um, anyway, on to better news. 100 million doses in the first 100 days was the aim. Well over 100, uh, 100 million doses of vaccine now given in the first 58 days of the uh, the new administration. Um, vaccine programs were started by the previous administration, carried on by Mr. Biden's administration, not attributing credit or blame, but it's it's picking up nicely, which is great. So this is the actual number administered: 115 million uh, administered so far. At least one dose, 75 million. Two doses, 40 million. So at least one dose, 22.7 of the population. 40, um, two doses, 12.3% of the population. It's really going quite well and it's accelerating. So Mr. Biden, as we've said a few days ago, all over 18s uh, eligible to receive doses by the 1st of May. So open booking by the 1st of May. And we also know that in the United States, they're working on a much more sophisticated computerized booking system because I've had so many people from the United States saying it's been chaos Telephone calls, hard to get through, websites not working, confused appointments. That is being sorted out and it will be. Again, the, the, the American uh, potential to organise once it gets going it is good. Now, good to see there's a few vaccines going from the States to Canada and Mexico. Uh, both countries much slower than they'd like to be. Canada especially really quite slow on the vaccine rollout compared to projections, Mexico 2.5 million doses, Canada 1.5 million doses. So not a massive amount, especially as we believe there's 30 million doses of AstraZeneca stockpiled in the United States waiting for the approval, which 
hopefully it'll happen fairly quickly. Now, um, not going to go on about vaccines today, but just briefly, um, let's say thousands of lives have been lost because of the delays, shall we say, in, in, uh, in Europe over the past week or so. Watch yesterday's video for the full detail. We're going to in, in, in quite a lot of detail there. But AstraZeneca vaccines being given today. So the United Kingdom Prime Minister Boris Johnson was vaccinated today. At least I think he was. I haven't seen the video yet, but um, that was the plan. So Simon Stevens, head of the NHS, 54, uh, uh, vaccinated yesterday. Now, good to see the Prime Minister. I'm not quite sure. Mid-50s, the Prime Minister, Sir Simon Stevens, mid-50s. Uh, both vaccinated on schedule. No jumping of the gun. Setting, And I really think that is setting a good example. So... I'm pleased they decided to wait like that and uh, got vaccinated with their age cohorts, as indeed are members of the royal family, which is, is, is I really feel it, that it's the way it should be. French Prime Minister, we believe, is vaccinated today with the Oxford AstraZeneca. Uh, Slovenian Prime Minister, we believe, vaccinated today. Uh, Amir Cook, she's the, uh, the European Medicines Agency Executive Director, we believe, vaccinated today. Um, now, Germany are starting vaccines today for the Oxford AstraZeneca restarting today. Now, this is interesting. France is restarting COVID-19 vaccines today only in the over 55s. So, of course, originally they didn't give the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine to over 65s. And now they're only giving it to over 55s. So... Um, <laughs> It's a bit confusing, but uh, but anyway, so, so France is only vaccinating people now over 55 with the Oxford AstraZeneca. The younger age groups are not receiving the Oxford AstraZeneca, according to the latest news that we have. And if you want the reasons for that, uh, look, watch yesterday's videos. Very, very small number of complications in, in the younger age groups. But that's the French decision. Um it's going to make the logistics difficult, but that's what they decided to do. Anyway, Italy starting again today, we believe. Spain, we believe, starting next Wednesday. Portugal, Lithuania, Latvia all starting again probably today. Netherlands resuming next week. And the Netherlands are saying that uh, 110,000 doses have been missed because of the one-week break. I mean, this is going to transpose into um, delayed problems and, and death. And, and we've seen that Europe's going into a third wave. Um Unfortunately, um, I'll maybe show that again, actually. Europe, Europe, Europe is going into a, a third wave. There, there we see it there, the European countries. I mean, it's pretty unmistakable now. And unlike the States, the vaccines are not keeping up. Nothing like. Uh, Denmark deciding today about the Oxford AstraZeneca. Sweden and Norway not decided yet. So um, fairly good news. The Oxford AstraZeneca basically is restarting in most places, and uh, but there's a bit of catching up to do. Um, interesting to see what data comes out in terms of side effects on the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, or whether they're just going to focus on the side effects of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine remains to be seen. Anyway, we've said enough about that over the past couple of days. Right, Germany Health Minister. Uh, insufficient vaccine doses in Europe to prevent a third wave, as we've said. So not good. Looks like the third wave is coming. Um, increasing cases in Germany in the past 48, in the past 24 hours. So they're starting to increase again. The rising number of cases could mean that we can't announce further steps towards reopening in the coming weeks. Quite the opposite. We may have to go backwards. So Germany may be introducing new lockdown measures, unfortunately, as spring comes on. Uh, Lars, this guy here from, from the Robert Koch Institute, uh, cases are rising exponentially. Um, called Robert Koch Institute, of course, the main institute in Germany looking after this kind of thing. Um, exponential increase in cases. Urge people not to travel in Easter. Uh, e Easter, of course, is a very big cultural event in Germany. And uh, people traditionally travel around, but he's urging people not to travel around for Easter in Germany. It's a serious situation. Uh, holding a vaccine summit to get family doctors involved uh, next month. So Germany, the federal government and the, the regional governments are holding a vaccine summit. Why are they holding a vaccine summit? 
so that doctors can start doing vaccines. I just don't get it. What the heck is delaying this in Germany? I mean, doctors doing vaccines. Well, whatever next? It's, it, I really don't understand. So they're hoping family doctors are going to start giving vaccines from next month. Um, you know, why haven't the doctors been doing it all along? Don't, don't pretend to understand that. Very, very strange bureaucratic system in Germany, it would appear. France, um, again, great, great increase in cases, largely driven by the UK variant of concern, although not entirely, as we'll see in a minute. Again, Prime Minister saying third wave looking increasingly likely in France. So here, here we have senior people in Germany and France saying the third wave is coming. Paris, 1,200 people in intensive care, moving people from intensive care in Paris out to other parts of France for care. Nationwide curfews being delayed. It was at, uh, did start at 6 o'clock now. It's starting at 7 p.m. because of the change in the daylight. But still there, still there. Uh, 20 more, 21 million people in 16 areas of France going under new restrictions. Limited lockdown for four weeks. Have to fill out a form before you go out of the house to say why you're going out. Now... Professor Neil Ferguson uh, is from um, Imperial College in London, I think. Anyway, uh, well-known um, epidemiologist. Um, talking about the situation in France, which he's been studying. Uh, now, apparently, five, according to Neil Ferguson, 5 to 10% of the cases in France are due to the South Africa VOC variant of concern. So this third wave in France is being driven by the UK variant and also the South Africa variant of concern, which is worrying. Well, obviously, it's a variant of concern. It's certainly concerning. Uh, that the, 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 uh, this is the variant we really want to keep out of the UK because the vaccines seem to have less efficacy or some degree of less efficacy against that strain. Now, uh, Neil Ferguson goes on to say... Um, the longer we can keep it out, the more time we have to vaccinate the whole adult population and to update vaccines to be able to cope with that variant. So all the traditional vaccines are going to slow it down somewhat and that will give us more time because we're probably going to need an extra vaccination that deals with the UK, the South African and who knows, even potentially the Brazilian variant in August or September this year. But the more people we can get vaccinated, the better we are. And yet 5 to 10 percent of the cases in France are the South African variant of concern now and they are poorly vaccinated. This is why the situation in Europe is is concerning. So we now know that at least in France, this increase is being driven by the South African variant of concern, as well as the now uh, ubiquitous, most prominent form of the virus, which is the U, so-called UK variant. This is going to carry on uh, increasing, unfortunately, despite the fact that spring is coming. Now, I look at some other countries around the world. Philippines, increasing cases. Uh, interesting to know that the Philippines have just approved the, uh, the Sputnik vaccine. Now, we have looked at the peer-reviewed data for the Sputnik vaccine, and it's good. It's good. It's fully published. It's now transparent. Um, given the data that I now have, I would be happy to accept the Sputnik vaccine myself. And it's being distributed fairly widely around the world, including now authorised in the Philippines for emergency use. M my original critique of that was that there wasn't the, uh, the published data. So for that vaccine now there is. So it's, it's now been shown to reach international standards, according to peer-reviewed public information. Uh, the Chinese vaccines haven't. There's no reason to suspect they don't work, but good to see that the Russians are now on board with that. And um, it's looking good. It's going to save a lot of lives. I don't think there's any question. India, population 1.38 billion. I mean, it's just phenomenal population. Uh, new cases in the last 24 hours, giving a total of 11.5 million cases. Uh, probably a great underestimate, but it is the highest in three months. Um, now, this is particularly concerning about India. In India, they've identified variants of concern from the United Kingdom, Brazil and South Africa. Now, the data I've read, there was only genomic analysis on 400 samples from India. 
this is very, very low, considering that India is actually a very sophisticated bioscientific country in many ways. In many ways. In many ways it's not, but in many ways it is. So they're not doing much genomic analysis, but 158 of those were... Uh, 158 out of the 400 with either the UK, the Brazil or the South Africa variant. So I don't have a bigger breakdown than that. It was just a popular news outlet article, but that is showing the VOCs growing exponentially. Well, we don't know they're growing exponentially in India, but we do know that the VOCs grow exponentially. So that is a concern for India, particularly uh, Western industrialised area, Maharashtra. So uh, Maharashtra's got like places like Mumbai, formerly called Bombay, Pune, where, where a lot of the vaccines are actually made, but very, very large population centres. 154 new deaths registered in India, but again, who really knows the actual number? Probably greater than that. September COVID-19, positive Indians turned away from hospitals, so they don't want this situation to happen again. Although having said that... Uh, Having done some work in India myself, it is sad to see that people with treatable pathology in India often don't get, can't afford treatment. So that's not anything new for India, unfortunately. Um, it's not a comparable situation to the UK or European country where you turn up and get treatment regardless. Um, but we did see some distressing videos at that time of people being turned away from hospitals and patients dying as they look for hospital admission. Now, a bit of a bit of a kerfuffle here. Uh, well, quite a big problem, really. Uh, reduced AstraZeneca vaccines from India, from Pune, in, in, uh, India Serological Institute, to the UK. Um, so now there's two views on this. Some people are saying that it's the Indian government that have restricted the uh, export of vaccines. And that does seem to be true. But other people are saying the reason for this is that India can't get supplies from the United States for vaccine components and things that are necessary for the production of vaccine, such as cell cultures. So it really looks like a lot of this vital information that's needed for the biological components that are required to make the vaccine is not public domain information, which is a real is a real problem actually because it means the Indians are, are having difficulty. So um, Indians, so some people in India are saying uh, that their redu their their in a, that their capacity to manufacture is is restricted by U.S. restrictions on some export exports, and this they say is related to the U.S. Defense Procurement National Emergency Regulations, which is inhibiting some exports of essential components. Now, even if this is true. I would appeal to the people that hold this information to put any information that is required to make things, to make the vaccines in the public domain, because thousands of lives are at stake here. I really hope there's no um, information that the Indians could be using to make their cell cultures um, uh, th that they are ignorant of that could be put into the public domain. Um, I don't understand any of the details, but I do know that some, this, some people in India are saying this. Serum Institute runs out of some components. UK to get 5 million fewer doses. This is a big dent in the UK supply. Sharing of technology for subcomponent production would be a good idea. If you know anyone with power in that area, please encourage them to do so. So, uh, so, so that's basically one, uh, art, one point of view that it's limited uh, amount of materials required to make the vaccine. Um, the other point of view is it's the, this is coming from the Indian government. I mean, there's probably truth in both. But Indian government is actually temporarily uh, holding exports. Five million doses were delivered to the UK in March. Five million doses pledged um, aren't coming uh, in April as we'd expected. Uh, when they come, uh, depends on when the government decides to release them. Pathetic that we're not making all the vaccines that we require in the UK. This is being remedied now, but it's, it's, um, it's a bit late for this pandemic in some respects. We are making vaccines in the UK, but clearly, clearly not enough. We're requiring uh, Indian manufacturing. 
to meet our requirements. And as of April, that's going to be um, limited. Um, this is the same all over the world. Countries all around the world are realising they've been caught short by their lack of indigenous vaccine production capacity. Uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, just north of Australia, of course. Population 9 million, patients being turned away from over on hospitals, apparently. Uh, now, we did yesterday look at data. There was, from memory, there was 400 samples from Papua New Guinea uh, sent to uh, Australia uh, for testing, and 50% of them were positive. So the positivity rate of 50% would indicate huge amounts of community spread in Papua New Guinea. It's like coming all of a sudden, having having escaped fairly well, it seems that they are being um, well and truly inundated by the pandemic now. So they're tightening border controls, they're restricting personal movement in PNG, uh, no mass gatherings, they're closing schools, enforcing mass wearing in public from the next few days. This is a bit ominous. May order burials in designated mass graves. So it looks like there's designating mass graves for people that are dying from this in PNG and we know that the Australians are desperately trying to get vaccines to them. A PNG has recorded a, a spike in cases in recent weeks with hundreds of new daily cases. Uh, the Australians are trying to get AstraZeneca vaccine from Europe. Um, hopefully once the Australian AstraZeneca vaccine gets going, production gets going in Melbourne, which it will be pretty soon, they will start exporting vaccines to Papua New Guinea, but unfortunately they need them three weeks ago. So uh, it looks like quite a lot of unnecessary deaths in Papua New Guinea with people being turned away from hospitals. So a pretty sad situation. Now an another situation, this is the last one for today. Uh, interesting, interesting. Cuba, 11 million, uh, 750 cases now. So there seems to be an increase in the number of cases in Cuba. I'm a bit concerned about the Brazilian variant in Cuba. I don't have data on this, but I know there's a fair bit of coming and going from Cuba to uh, to two southern parts of the Americas. Now, Cuba's a bit strange. It's been isolated in a lot of ways for obvious geopolitical reasons. Um, and and what, what's actually happened in Cuba is they've kind of pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps as far as medicine is concerned. So in Cuba, they train up a lot of doctors from uh, Spanish-speaking South America and then they send them back to South America. Uh, the medical systems in Cuba are actually very advanced. So although there's only 11 million people in Cuba, because they've been cut off, they've like had to do things on their own. And um, they, they export a lot of medical expertise and have developed a lot of medical expertise themselves independently. So um, whether you approve of the Cuban political system or not, it doesn't matter. But their 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 medical self sufficiency is uh, impressive, impressive. Um, and they've approved a second vaccine candidate for stage three clinical trials uh, called uh, Ab Abdala. I'm not pronouncing it correctly. They're currently recruiting forty eight thousand people. So this is this is a, an indigenous homemade well, in country made, in Cuba made vaccine. Uh, and they're testing it in Cuba with a full scale clinical trial. Um, and uh, another vaccine here already in, in phase three clinical trials. Um, and Cuba um, is using people from Cuba to test the vaccine. And they're also trialing it in Iran. Now, when I was young, my mum put me to bed and didn't know if she would get me up in the morning because of the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was related to Cuba and uh, the Soviet Union, as it was then. And, and you don't need to tell me about the potential, or I don't need to tell you about the potential geopolitical implications of Cuba, just off the coast of Florida, of course, um, working closely with Iran. So it might be a good time for uh, Western nations to start collaborating medically uh, much more with Cuba than it, they have been doing. Um, but given that the good track record that Cuba has on, on medical uh, things, I wouldn't be surprised if both of these vaccines pan out and they start exporting it to other parts of South America. And are they going to be exporting it to Iran, other parts of the Middle East? Interesting interesting they are working on it um 
So Cuba's got considerable vaccine experience. Both of these target the spike protein, as you might expect with the current generation of vaccine. But unfortunately in Cuba so far, no COVID vaccines have been uh, given um, at all. And yet there's increasing cases. So it's looking like, again, a bit like the Papua New Guinea situation, the vaccines might just be that little bit late in, in Cuba. So uh, implications well beyond the, the medical implications of, of vaccine production there as, as Cuba uh, cooperates with Iran. Right, OK, that is us for today. Um, that sadly, Europe is going into a third wave and um, we expect that to increase. We'll keep an eye on it. Uh, let's hope the vaccination programme can somehow be accelerated but so far it hasn't been been good and this delay will lead to potentially th thousands of deaths over over the next weeks in Europe um, that's the way I see it at the moment unfortunately okay thank you of course for watching